Hello everyone, welcome back to Eternal Basics. My name is Pojo, and today we're going to be talking about value, which uh, I would probably loosely define as the measure of resources that you have gained versus the measure of resources that you have spent. Now, we've secretly been talking about value the whole time in terms of what it is that we are doing. Uh, we are trying to accomplish a particular goal. We need particular tools to accomplish the goal, and whatever those tools are provides certain types of value to us. So, for example, red cards we are looking for with our Firestarter deck, we were looking for or damage into the face as value, and that is sort of how we evaluate the value of those cards. For a green setup, we were looking for something that takes control of the board and does cool things like that. Now, in general, what we are looking for is whatever it is that the card does that is most valuable to our particular plan. However, we usually break down value in terms of a couple of specific ideas. Board advantage, card advantage, and of course, straight damage for cards like Firestarter. So uh, we've talked a little bit about board advantage, and what we're going to talk about now is card advantage, specifically in terms of size and strength of cards, as well as in terms of how many different effects and how many different things are happening with a card when we play it. So the basic concept of card advantage is that in a game of Eternal, you're playing a deck of cards, you draw a single card a turn, and every time that we are playing these cards, we're doing something with the card that hopefully affects our opponent's cards on board and affects our opponent's cards in hand. Eventually, one of us is gonna run out of cards, and the person who does is typically the person who has played the less efficient, smaller cards, or the cards that didn't do as much and didn't accrue as much value. Once that happens, our opponent is left in what we call top deck mode. They are drawing off the top of their deck, hoping for the card that they want in order to save themselves or to get themselves into a better situation. Whereas we have a variety of options in our hand, or multiple threats that we can play per turn, and we can then seize the advantage on board and therefore seize the game. So we are another step removed from victory in terms of what we're planning to do, but we are in the better terms, basically planning for a slow and inevitable victory. And this is one of the basis of mid-range decks and controlled decks, which we are going to be playing in our next two basics videos. So for Sands of Time, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be evaluating cards based on what type of value they provide and how it is that that affects our deck and what we're trying to do. So first things first, let's look at a couple of cards that have no inherent value for our deck and are going to be really, really rough for us in terms of what we're trying to set up. So right now there's a little bit of a combo in this list that doesn't really work for us. Hall of Lost Kings with the 25 or more health, which is pretty hard to get, plus a couple of health gain cards. And there's actually only, I think, three of them in the entire deck. We have Oasis Sanctuary, which gains five health, and Healer's Cloak. Uh, that does make four because there are four, but I'm going to cut only one Healer's Cloak, which will put it down to three. Um, yeah, so let's talk about Oasis Sanctuary first. This is a card that does not exist in packs and primarily exists as a lesson on how to play Eternal. And while the lesson on how to play Eternal is first just what a spell is and what gains life, there's a second lesson to be learned, which is that this is probably the worst card in Eternal in terms of value. As a 3-cost card, it only gains 5 health. Uh, for an example of a card that provides much more value, there's a card called Water of Life that for 1 draws a second copy of itself, so you can play it for 2, and will gain you 6 life, so it's already a little bit more efficient. But more than that, the card doesn't actually do anything to your opponent, it doesn't do anything to the board state, and it doesn't do anything to win you the game which means that as a card, Oasis Sanctuary has no inherent value. It's only useful if we are using it in combination with cards like Hall of Lost Kings, or cards that have life force abilities, or any sort of effect where we get to gain life and get a benefit out of it. As such, because it is both really inefficient and also not good for our plan, those two things mean that we are just not getting what we want out of this card, and we definitely want to cut it. It's strictly bad, it's definitely not going into the deck. 
Some other cards that we're going to cut, we have Silence, a card that silences a unit. Now, this is pretty nice in theory because uh, it's fairly cheap for a small effect, but overall it doesn't actually do anything to the board state. It still leaves the unit on board and it costs us a card, which again leads to us running out of cards before our opponent. So that card's also going to get cut. Uh, we're going to cut Teleport as well, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, why we're cutting Teleport, but the primary reason for this is that this card puts a unit into its owner's hand. That's a useful effect because it can get rid of weapons on a unit, which in that fashion can provide you with value. But we have a card in our deck already called Praxis Displacer, which does the same thing. It is a spell attached to a unit, and it is effectively two cards for the price of one. So. Even though this costs us more power to play, it has more value as a card in card advantage because we are getting those effects in just one card and we don't have to play two cards to get both effects. So we really want to do that instead of play teleports. So we're going to cut the teleport and we're actually going to up those Praxis Displacers up to four. Some other cards that are pretty low value for us include Tower Top Patrol, a card that is largely defensive in application. It can be used to push damage across, but we're not trying to slow the game down. We are trying to slow the game down somewhat, but we're mostly trying to win the game by trading with our opponent's units. Tower Top Patrol doesn't do this very often, so we're going to go ahead and cut that card out. Uh, we also have Elysian Pathfinder. This is actually a high value card. As a 3-3, it also gives us a spell-like effect with its summon ability. And in general, you should find that summon abilities are typically a good indication of a high value card. Uh, but the main problem here is that at 7 for a 3-3, this card does not do a lot on board immediately. And even if we get the Echo unit, that may not help us out in the long run. We're probably going to cut Elysian Pathfinder to make room for some other better cards. But you can keep it around if you want to. It does have some benefits. All right, I mentioned that Healer's Cloak is not a high value card. This card does swing for an exceptional amount of life in our decks, but we're actually going to cut both copies of it here because it's just not doing enough of what we want. All right, anything else here that kind of isn't great on value? Most of these other cards are at least relatively efficient. We are going to make some up swaps for various types of cards, but those are the only ones that are like really specifically bad for us and don't do anything to advance our plan. So we're going to make some other trades here too, and let's go ahead and talk about those as we go through them. First off, Towering Terrazon. Four, a 5 cost 6 5 is a pretty fine body for 5, doesn't hurt too badly, like it's probably something that we're okay with playing, but we actually have a card here that we're going to swap in that we like a lot more, and it's called Twin Brood Sauropod. Now Twin Brood Sauropod is a 5 4 with Echo, that means that we draw an extra copy of it when we draw this card. Now there are ways to make this card get drawn multiple times, but mostly what we care about here is that we get two cards for the price of one, and even though we have to pay the cost for both of these cards, we nonetheless have more cards than our opponent if our opponent is spending single target removal on the first Sauropod, then he's going to have some problems with the second Sauropod. So that's really the kind of thing that we're looking for to run our opponent out of threats. They're also really good with a card called Ageless Mentor that we're already running in the deck. So we're pretty happy with that. Now, this board does need some interaction. We have a card called Predator's Instinct, which gives us the ability to kill smaller units with our bigger units, and I'm always a big fan of this card in general. Giving a unit killer allows us to do special attacks against our opponent's stuff. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to up that to four, and we're going to do something else which is we're, with it, which is we're going to introduce a card called the... Brush Stalker, or the Snapping Brush Stalker, to be precise. This is a 5 5 for 4, very, very high value, but it has a drawback that we can turn into an advantage. When an enemy spell is played, Snapping Brush Stalker goes back to our hand. This may seem annoying at first, but it actually means that Snapping Brush Stalker is much more resilient than most units to the average spell. So as a result, we can actually repeat effects like Predator's Instinct by playing it on the Brush Stalker, killing a unit, and then the next time that it gets bounced back to our hand, when we summon it, it will have Killer again. So we get to use the Killer effect multiple times with Brush Stalker. That's a kind of card advantage that we're really looking to leverage, so we're going to do everything we can to force our opponent to play those spells and give us the Brush Stalker back once it has Killer. That's definitely in the making. 
We're gonna also add some Xenon initiations on top of those Predator's Instinct, just so we have a little bit of extra value on these Brush Stalkers, and so we can make our big units count more on board. That's gonna be a pretty important part. Now, because the Brush Stalker comes in, another card has to come out, and that's Horned Vorlunk, the 3-4 Overwhelm. This card overall is a little bit okay. It doesn't really run that well in ranked decks, but it's fine. Uh, I would say that overall it's just a little underwhelming and doesn't do enough. I like that it dodges Vanquish and also dodges Torch, but other than that, it's just a little bit too weak for the cost that it is offering. So we're going to cut that card out, and we're going to see what else we can put in as a result. All right, some other things that we want to cut. We have Bold Adventurer. This card is a 2-3 two, for 2. I actually do like this card quite a bit in most types of decks, if we're, especially if we're playing for synergy with explorers. But what we're going to replace it with is far more important to a time mid-range strategy, and that is a card called Temple Scribe. This is a 1-1 one, one that draws a card when it is played. This is a really important effect. There aren't that many cards that actually do this, and it's important to note when they do, because essentially this card will always replace itself, meaning that no matter what, you cannot lose by playing this card, or you cannot lose card advantage by playing this card. You will always get a card back, so even if your opponent kills it in some way, there's no way in which you don't get some benefit out of it uh, by putting it down on the board. The one health is nice too, it actually gives us another source of uh, life gain, which can be good for stalling out into the late game. And we like life gain effects when they are on units and they actually do something to the board. For example, Temple Scribe is a great way to counter Oni Ronins, the card that we were talking about in Firestarter. So really, really fun stuff. This is a good blocker for us and a good way to stall out. Talir's favorite is doing something very similar, except it's drawing a specific card, the Time Sigil, and uh, we certainly want to have more of those, so we're going to be running that as well. All right. Next up, next up, we have ourselves our Praxis Displacers and our Snapping Brush Stalkers. Some cards that we do want to bring in. I want to increase the number of Scorpion Wasps. Now, this card is just really, really good at trading with units that are bigger than it, and that's tends to be pretty good value. It's also just a good defensive unit to establish ourselves on board and get us into a better situation. So multiple scorpion wasps can be very handy, and we really like this card in that sort of setup. We're going to cut the Hall of Lost Kings because we definitely don't want that there, and we're going to talk a little bit about Ancient Lore. Now this is card advantage at its most basic. Ancient Lore draws two cards for the price of one, so we always get two cards out of Ancient Lore any time that we play it. In addition, we also get that plus one plus one bonus, which we can apply to cards like Twin Brood Sauropod twice. This makes some of our cards, like Temple Scribe and Talir's Favorite, a lot more useful, and it also is very good for making our bigger units much bigger than our opponents. So we're very happy to play this type of card, and we're going to run four Ancient Lore just so that we can draw as many cards as humanly possible and keep ourselves ahead of the curve. That actually does it for most of our major changes. As you can see, we're looking pretty stacked. Some cards that don't have great value might be considered moving considered for moving later on include Unlock Potential, which is a card that tends to benefit our Talir's Favorites and Temple Scribes quite a bit. Unlock Potential, ideally, we're going to want to eventually swap for Zine and Obelisk, which gives plus one, plus one to all of our units and gives us plus two, plus two when we have eight or more maximum power. This card is a powerhouse in most time decks, and Mono Time in particular is very happy with it. Lumen Shepherd is a card that we're probably going to want to swap eventually, but for the moment it plays as a free 1-1 one, one Wisp, which we can then unlock potential and do some interesting shenanigans with. So we're going to go ahead and play that out. The last thing to change about the deck would be the power. We're going to cut out seven of these time sigils, just so that we can play in some other types of power, specifically your waystones, which are always a good substitution if you're in a monocolored deck, because they basically have no drawbacks in monocolored decks. And we're also going to include three of a card called Amber Monument, which is a 5-5 Reinarch Dinosaur with Overwhelm if we have five power or more. Otherwise, it plays as a depleted power, which is to say it's exhausted the turn that we play it, and we don't get the power immediately, but we get it every turn after that. Um, this card just allows us to make more of our cards valuable to us. So in times when we are drawing time sigils late in the game and we don't want to be, Amber Monument is there to pick up the slack, because instead of being a time sigil, it'll be a big dinosaur. We're generally pretty happy with that result. 
All right, that about does it for the Sands of Time list. There are further improvements that can be made, especially to time mid-range lists, but this is good enough to take for a spin. So we're going to play a couple rounds with it and see how they go. All right, here we are up against Quadro. And looking at the opener, I'm not super psyched about this hand. Amber Monument is a single power, and we don't have a second. And since this deck really wants to play a lot of four and five drops, we're going to redraw and see if we can pick up a little bit more. Three power is pretty good, and we've also got Temple Scribe into Reliquary Raider. We didn't talk about Reliquary Raider yet, but Reliquary Raider is a card advantage engine. Every single time that it attacks, it draws a card, so all we have to do is clear the way for Reliquary Raider, and this card will win the game on its own, just by drawing more and more stuff for us to help out. So it's yeah, it could be really, really good. We're very excited about that. We're going to play that Temple Scribe down, get ourselves a little bit of life, and we're at the same number of cards that we had before, which is the full six. Seed of Order and my opponent playing an Awakened Student. That's a pretty rough card. This card gets bigger over time. We're gonna wanna find ways to kill it if we can, but we at the moment, Reliquary Raider should keep it at bay. My opponent's not gonna wanna attack when Reliquary Raider can defend, and uh, we can do some cool things that way. Now, Snapping Brushstalker is a tricky four drop here. We generally prefer not to have it here. We'd wanna do some other shenanigans, but uh, I think it's worth playing here if we can do it. Let's go ahead and play that down. That gives us a 5-5 five, five to fiddle around with. Relic Raider could attack in here, but we'd be trading one card for a card in hand, and I don't need that card in hand at the moment, so we're just going to stay put. Maybe my opponent plays a spell here, like Stand Together, to pop Snapping Brushstalker out. Maybe he uses Vanquish, and the Brushstalker doesn't die, meaning my opponent has traded 1 for 0. Still, he's a little bit ahead on board, so we got to make sure that other stuff happens to kill these guys sooner rather than later. All right, Temple Scribe is a perfectly good card here. Stalls out a little bit and draws me into a Scorpion Wasp. And Reliquary Raider gets to attack here, which means I get another card drawn. And what do you know? Another Chump Blocker. So we have some cards that aren't terribly valuable that we can throw in front of these 4-4s. Four and I also have the Scorpion Wasp, which I'm definitely down for. The more cards that I draw, the more power I get, which also leads to us playing even higher value cards like Predatory Carnosaur. That's really beneficial to us. We want to be able to do that kind of thing when we can. And Scorpion Wasp here is trading with a unit that is bigger than it and buffer than it, although a little bit less expensive than it, so I'd say that he's still getting some value out of that trade. Nonetheless, we see those attacks, and we're going to see what else gets played. All right, looks like a Huru Pacifier. As a 3-4 flyer, this card is kind of obnoxious. I would really like it to be dead, so I'm going to go ahead and kill it right now. And the reason we're going to kill it right now is because that allows us to attack with our Reliquary Raider again. That kind of value is always something we're looking for, and what do you know? It's a Talir's Favorite, which again draws more cards into our hand. So even though we're sacrificing our Temple Scribes, we already drew the cards that we needed off of that, so we're pretty happy with that result. Quadro's not looking so great right now. He's probably not even terribly comfy with attacking me. He uses Stand Together to defend his Awakened Student, which means that he can now trade with my 6-6. Six, six. That's a 2-for-1 trade, and I'm perfectly happy to take it. We're going to go ahead and attack for 6 here. And there we go. We get our damage in. So now my opponent is low on cards, and I still have lots of stuff to play. I'm going to play Talir's Favored here to get myself a little bit more power, because I want to play Talir who sees beyond. She's the ultimate value engine. Every time that a time unit is drawn, not only do we get to play that unit as though we just drew it, we also get that unit an extra card. So that's really, really solid stuff. Like, that's the kind of infinite value engine that we can absolutely work with. And we even have an activator for it, which is to say Reliquary Raider can do exactly what we want to do with it. All right. Praxis Displacer can bounce this Unseen Commando back to hand, but I think what we want to do is the full combo, right? We're going to play Talir Who Sees Beyond. Our time units now have Destiny, so when we draw them, they're going to get cool things going on. Oh, but that's too much for my opponent. He's not even going to see if the Reliquary Raider draws a time unit. He is out of cards, he's out of gas, and he's out of the game. Good stuff. 
Here we are up against Flurk, and what do we got here? It looks like a handful of power, enough power to play cards, which is nice. I don't like that we don't have any two drops here, so I'm tempted to throw this back, but four power is pretty good. Ancient Lore gets us some card draw. I am first here, so eh, I think we're going to toss it. All right, we have an Initiative Sands. That's a really solid one. This gets us some ramp so that we can get up to our bigger threats a little bit faster. It's not going to do anything for us this turn because we don't have a 3-drop to play, but maybe we'll get something cool off Temple Scribe that we can play. Odds are not in our favor on that, but at least getting to Sauropod on 4 would be awesome. Move over. I'll handle this. All right, what do we know? It's the Steady Marshal, the Gunslinger of Gunslingers. Right Let's go ahead and throw our Temple Scribe up, and look at that, we found a Predatory Carnosaur. Not quite the card we're looking for, but maybe we can do something with it. All right, I'd expect to see a Gunslinger here, seeing as he's got Gunslinger allies. What's he working for? Ooh, he's thinking. Oh, he's not attacking. Interesting. He doesn't have his Gunslinger, so he's just kind of sitting still here. We can't attack into him, so he's doing fine on that front. But Rakano is normally a bit more aggressive, so this is a lucky break for us. If we can just play down our units, we'll be in pretty good shape. Oh, hey, Oni Quartermaster. That card is very, very nasty. That card gets him a lot of value because every time he plays a weapon, he gets to replace that weapon. We talked already about how draw a card effects are really powerful in Eternal. That's the kind of value engine that he definitely wants to be running. We have a good answer for it. It's Predatory Carnosaur. But if we don't find that answer, we're going to be in trouble. So let's play our Sauropod down, and let's see if we can get some trades going. Move over. Ooh, Steady Marshal, that's two draws. One for each of the Steady Marshal's revolvers, so pretty rough stuff. He's got some cool things going on here. I like this deck a lot. Uh, we see a 2-2 Rakano Outlaw, which is also quite sweet. I'm going to go ahead and attack for five here, and we're going to see if we can trade with some of his units. All right, as you can see, Steady Marshal trades pretty well with our Twin Brood Sauropod. I think I maybe even could have used Unlock Potential there, and that might have been a little bit better, but we'll see. What else is happening here? This Predatory Carnosaur needs to kill something. I'd say the Rakano Outlaw is very dangerous, but obviously the Quartermaster is even better. If we can find the right card, that's going to be ideal. Okay. Milos Azaleo is definitely a rough one. I think at this point we have to get rid of that 2-2. Two -two. So we're going to use Carnosaur. We're going to kill this 2-2. Two -two. And that means we no longer have to deal with weird weapon-based threats. That's going to really help us out. I think, in general, I shouldn't have attacked with that 5-4. Being uh, that aggressive there lost me some value on board, and I could have kept my good blockers up and maybe looked for cards like Finest Hour or other things to make for sort of better trades. But, eh. We committed a bit too much, and we'll see exactly how much that ends up hurting us. Another Steady Marshal there. Uh, my 6-6 six -six is actually okay to attack in, because he can trade pretty well. So we'd be pretty happy with a 1 for 0 followed by a 2 for 1. Vanquish, however, will clear that up. It's still a 2 for 1, since we got the Vanquish and the Oni Quartermaster. And we denied him a bunch of card advantage that he would be able to use otherwise. So, yeah, overall, we feel pretty comfy with that. I'm going to go ahead and throw down a second Sauropod, and I'm going to wait until all of my Sauropods are down before unlocking potential here, because we're looking at a pretty rough board in terms of aggression. We want to be able to trade evenly with as much of this as possible. And Milo's Azaleo in particular is a scary customer, my goodness. What have we got? The good news is that every one of our sauropods is more than capable of trading with his gunslingers in good ways, so we feel pretty comfy with that. I've also got Scorpion Wasp, so I can trade with any of his units that get too big with weapons and keep myself ahead on cards that way. But I really need some better answers here, and that's not really going to help things out. Alright, so now we're in a bit of trouble. This Rakano Outlaw is basically endless value. The Steel Fang Chakram is going to be constantly a thorn in our side. We need to actually make some things happen now. So we're going to go ahead and draw some cards. Praxis Displacer is perfect for this type of thing. And in fact, I think I'm actually going to play Praxis Displacer right now, since it denies the draw to the Rakano Outlaw. 
That gives me a little bit of time to play around. Steel Fang Chakram goes back into his void so he can play it again, but we now have a bigger board and we can start getting aggressive with him. Oh, Azaleo, hello. Now Azaleo's dealing a lot of damage. Fortunately, we have Scorpion Wasps for this, so we're not in too much trouble, but this still gets pretty scary pretty fast. I'm gonna go ahead and play an Initiative Sands. And I'm going to unlock potential so that all of my units are a little bit bigger. That'll give me some good trades later on. It'll allow me to do some double blocks if I choose to. And by attacking with a bunch of units here, we get some potentially good trades and we start putting pressure back on our opponent. I know I have the Scorpion Wasp, so I'm safe from Azaleo as long as we are just capable of generating some decent stuff happening. Um, so we're going to attack in. I get a full 12 damage. I feel pretty comfy with that. Let's go ahead and uh, pretend that we're losing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll see how well that works. I'm guessing he's not gonna fall for it. All right, Scorpion Wasp trades with Azaleo and Azaleo's Inquisitor's Blade. Now that blade does come back, which is kind of scary, and obviously Torch does trade evenly as well. But look at our current aggressive hand. We're actually looking pretty good here. Stella the Shot Caller, pushing out. Rakano Outlaw, lots and lots of good stuff. I'm so glad I drew that next Scorpion Wasp. I'm gonna play Twin Brood Sauropod, and I'm gonna swing with everything now, because I wanna win this game. I've got the board advantage, I have the card advantage, and I think that we can push this out before any sort of weird combos come out. So we're gonna push everything we've got as far down his throat as we can, and we're just gonna try for that damage, try to get the beat down going before he outvalues us on cards like Steel Fang Chakra. Those infinite combos, man, they're pretty scary. Let's let's try and win this thing. Alright, he's still got a Steel Fang Chakra, right? So he's gonna try and play that on something. What are we gonna see it played on? Probably this 2-2. If he plays it on the 2-2, that means that he doesn't have a torch, which is really, really good for me. And that means that I can throw my Scorpion Wasp in front of the 6-5, win the game on the crackback. If he does it somewhere else, then, you know, that's a different kind of thing. I go... Okay, we see Rakano Outlaw getting that quick draw now. Scorpion Wasp here gets to throw out for the block. And no torch this time. He's out of it. Doesn't have the trick. Inquisitor's Blade gets thrown, and that crackback is going to kill him, so he forfeits. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Really, really solid game. I'm very happy with that result. Alright, it's at this point that I'd like to introduce you to a card that's going to be one of your greatest friends and worst enemies for a lot of your eternal career. This is Sandstorm Titan, a 4 cost 5 6 with endurance that reads units cannot fly. Uh, so this guy can attack, he can defend, and he can do an awful lot of really, really good stuff. Uh, he's very, very good in most types of time decks, and indeed most time decks will run him, so you'll run into this card a lot as one of the first legendaries that people tend to craft, and actually one of the more valuable legendaries that people can have in most types of decks. Now, here's the thing about Sandstorm Titan. He's not completely broken. He's been around for two years, and he's had an influence on the meta to be sure. He's been around for quite some time, but he's never made time the best faction out of all of the factions, despite being probably one of the best units in stats that you can play at 4. There's some 7-7s seven coming out in Fall of Argentport, which will be out at the time of this video, uh, which may give him a bit of a run for his money, but for the most part, Sandstorm Titan is definitely working for, working for his money. So why is it that Sandstorm Titan doesn't necessarily deal well with the rest of the meta in the way that you would expect. Well, there are a lot of cards that answer him. You've got Annihilate and Vanquish, you have Slay, you have Polymorph, you have Quick Draw units with torches, you have all sorts of ways that you can trade into this, even in the later game where you can use cards like Predatory Carnosaur or other options to eat the guy. You can use Finest Hour and other shenanigans to get bigger than him. You can do a lot to kill a Sandstorm Titan with a one-for-one one trade, and sometimes you can even two-for-one trade into him and still feel okay. Like, you can be okay with that because your deck might have a better plan than the Sandstorm Titan's deck. 
And that's the thing about value as a metric. It's a very good metric to be sure, and it's very useful when you're building decks out of disparate amounts of cards. If you're looking for cards that are good, you wanna look for cards that do things on board quickly. You wanna look for cards that draw you extra cards. You wanna look for cards that can trade well with other units and that have stats that are very efficient for their cost. All of those things are very, very good for picking cards, and I highly recommend keeping all of those factors in mind, especially when playing forges or drafts, and while building your collection and building initial decks. But keep in mind that your value metric shifts based on what it is that your deck plan is. So if you are trying to be aggressive, like a Firestarter deck, you may not play that many cards that draw cards or trade well with units. You only care about what does face damage. So based on what your plan is, value is different for every type of deck. And I think that's an important thing to note as we sort of end out this uh, segment on value. I would say that overall, you're always looking for cards like Sandstorm Titan. You want to fill out parts of your deck with these cards. But keep in mind that Sandstorm Titan isn't 100% of the time going to be the best card for your time deck. And the question of what is then becomes a really, really interesting one. That's it for me. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I am Pojo, and this has been Eternal Basics. We'll be back with a primal brew in just a day or two. See you soon.